Hi, everyone. Uh, we're going to get started now covering HR and benefits compliance steps to protect your business, presented by Lillian Shapiro, president of HR 360. Thanks very much, Frank, and welcome one and all to our webinar today. And it's going to cover, just to be very brief about giving you a quick overview, there's so many different types of requirements from the federal, federal government, and that's in addition to sometimes state requirements related to the human resource functions and benefits and so forth. So what we're gonna do is do a, a summary kind of walkthrough of some of the most essential ones that you really should be paying attention to. And without any further ado, Frank, let's go on to our first slide. So now we're gonna take a little bit of a look at some of the most common benefits notices mistakes. Now there are quite a few required benefits notices, especially if you offer a group health plan, but we're gonna just do a couple of the ones we see kind of recurring themes or people sometimes confused or sometimes not really understanding what they need to do, and that's what we're covering right now. So it's important to maintain and distribute a summary plan description. A lot of us know it as an SPD to all plan participants if you have an ERISA-covered group health insurance plan. Small employers must comply with this federal law. So the confusion out there is, you know, there's something called an SBC, and sometimes uh, folks get a benefit summary but that does not comply with the requirements from ERISA as to what should be in a summary plan description or an SPD. And thus, you really have to have that um, as part of what is provided to a plan participant. And very, very important, by the way, if the Department of Labor or the DOL were to audit uh, any employer out there, what that would mean is they would be asking for an SPD. And if the employer didn't have one, they would quite simply fail that particular audit. So it is very, very important that they have, not only obviously have the SPD, but distribute it in a timely fashion to uh, plan participants. Companies with 20 or more employees must provide employees with required notices regarding continuation of health coverage under COBRA. This is a federal notice, or actually it's a couple of notices, but it's important to remember that if an employer has over 20 or more, 20 or more employees, so it's either 20 or more, not over 20, there's a confusion out there, 20 or more, they must provide those notices related to continuation of health coverage uh, under the COBRA regulations. Now, a kind of offshoot of this, it's not federal, it's state, but if an employer has less than 20 employees, okay, so it no longer is under the uh, requirement or governance of COBRA, but many, many states out there, the vast majority, have what they call mini-COBRA or state continuation of coverage related laws. And, and one of them, and actually quite a few of them, relate to not only the continu continuation of benefits or when benefits are terminated or what constitutes qualifying events and so, so on and so forth, but it's very, very important for everybody out there to make sure if they're under 20 employees and they're no longer subject to the federal required notices that they check their own state laws, which of course are available for many of you on your HR library site uh, under the state laws and it would be under state continuation of coverage. So let's continue on, Frank, thank you. Now I'm gonna spend a moment on the Affordable Care Act and your business and as I'm sure many of you might be aware, I'm just gonna quickly talk about it. At this juncture, there's a lot happening in Washington, D.C. The Republican uh, uh, House and Senate are attempting to repeal and replace what is known as the Affordable Care Act. All, all of us have been complying with that since uh, it was passed in 10 and many of the laws went into effect in 2014. My only message to you today is, as much as you might be hearing that everybody wants to do all kinds of things to the Affordable Care Act, replace it and do this and do that. Nothing has been passed as yet. So it's important for everybody to do what they have been doing, which is comply with all of the ACA, or we like to say ACA requirements. They're still in effect, including penalties. Nothing has changed. So it's very, very important for everybody to understand that when the laws are in effect, and that is what is there, you must comply. Even though you think things might change down the road, we absolutely don't know. And this thing is whipsawed back and forth 
So please continue complying with ACA related requirements. Let's continue, Frank, thank you. So now we're gonna get into various aspects of the employee cycle of the relationship, hiring, performance re reviews, and so forth. There's a lot going on, and there are a lot of different requirements related to the different aspects of having an employee work for you. So first and, first and foremost, make sure all interview questions are appropriate and relate directly to the position and the applicant's ability to perform the job's essential functions. So what we mean by that is <laughs> try if possible, although I some folks think it's really, hey, it's great to make small talk and just kind of just chat away. Sometimes by doing that, you get into areas where questions might have, might relate to something that could be construed as discriminatory. And that's what you want to steer completely clear of. And how do you do that in, the, in its simplest fashion? It's very, it's very straightforward. Talk about the job, the responsibilities, all aspects related to the performance of the essential functions, and then you know you're safe. It's that simple. Make sure questions do not discriminate based on race, sex, religion, age, ethnic group, national origin, marital status, military service, disability, or other protected status. Even something that might seem innocent to you or innocuous that do you have something like do you have children or something like that, that could be construed as well, depending on what they answered, that, um, you know, and they didn't get the job, that could be an issue. So you steer away from any of those areas and stick with the interview questions related to the performance of the position, and you know you're on safe ground. So let's continue on, Frank, thank you. Continuing this area of hiring do's and don'ts, don'ts. If doing a background check of a candidate, this is very important, be sure to have written permission from the candidate and all Fair Credit Reporting Act, we call it FACRA, requirements satisfied, along with any state requirements for conducting background checks. This is a very sensitive area. A number of states have passed laws related to this. Again, your HR, if you have your HR library um, site for many of you, you have it. This is all covered in there. And so you really have to make sure that it, there are certain forms and policies and procedures and they must be complied with. This is, again, a very, very important area, especially in terms of if you wanna do a credit check and you wanna get, get that background check, you really have to get written permission and there's a very specific form involved from the candidate, as well as additional um, Fair Credit Reporting Act requirements. So there really has to be a paper trail, absolute, uh, uh, absolute um, permissions and um, various number of other types of notices and so forth to make sure that you're doing the right thing when it comes to background checks and to please check state laws as well. Another sensitive area altogether are confirming policies and procedures related to drug testing, use of arrest and conviction, conviction records, and other candidate information requests. You have to make sure it complies with applicable federal, state, and local laws. There are a lot of laws in this area and so you want to make sure, even though you might think you're doing the absolute right thing by getting information about this, states vary tremendously on this. So you want to make sure that you're in compliance not only with federal law, but of course with state and local law. So let's continue on, Frank. Thank you. Additional do's and don'ts as it relates to hiring. Be sure forms I-9 are completed for all new employees within three business days from the first day of work for pay. Now, especially for smaller companies, one might think, well, gee, do I have to do this? Absolutely. This is extremely important from the standpoint of security. It is a requirement, it's a federal requirement, and they must be kept in a safe place, these forms I-9, and they must be completed for each new hire. There's just no if, ands, or buts about it, must be completed. In addition, you want to satisfy new hiring reporting requirements and necessary tax forms, i.e. Form W-4 and any other required state form. So there's a lot of activities you can see beyond just the interview process. You've got to get all that paperwork in order per employee. So let's continue on. Thanks. 
now we're going to get into a little bit of federal minimum wage and overtime requirements. Now, a lot of us are familiar with that, right? You're, you're familiar with your, your, your federal minimum wage rate and so forth. But I'm just going to quickly review with you and also talk about exempt. People who are exempt from the minimum wage. Um, so let's first look at minimum wage. So what's going on as far as federal laws generally require employers to pay, for, pay their employees at least the federal minimum wage for all hours worked and overtime paid for any hours worked over 40 hours, any work week. And I'm here to basically say to please be sure to check your state law requirements for minimum wage rates and overtime pay. They do change and you have to know exactly what they are at any given time during the year. Many of them change uh, if they are going to change at all, you know, for usually in December for a January start date. But depending on the state, they could change at any point during the year and sometimes in counties and in cities. Just as an example, San Francisco has its, all, its own set of uh, wage rates and uh, so on and so forth. So you really have to be careful to make sure that you know exactly what those rates are for your particular location. Now, the law does exempt certain employees from these requirements, most notably executive and administrative employees. And we're just going to go on to the next slide because I think there, sometimes there's a confusion about what is, it, what is an exempt employee? How, how are they exempted? from um, the minimum wage rates and, and just get onto a salary. So first we're gonna talk about exempt executive employees. There's two different levels, executive and administrative. So exempt executive employees, what does that mean? They're compensated on a salary basis, a rate not less than $455 per week. Now, the part I'm gonna to get to now is where the biggest confusion is. I think folks think, oh, well, I'm just gonna call this employee an exempt employee because I'm just gonna pay him a salary but that's really incorrect. They really, the employee has to conform to very, very specific federal requirements. And what are they? Here's the ones for executive employees. The employee's primary duty must be managing the enterprise or managing a customarily recognized department or subdivision of the enterprise. So there is a, an entire management aspect to an executive exempt employee. So it's important to keep that in mind if that's, what you're doing. The employee must customarily and regularly direct the work of at least two or more other full-time employees or their equivalent. So now we've got two, right? We've got two different um, requirements. And let's go to the next slide. The employee must have the authority to hire or fire other employees or the employee's suggestions and recommendations as to the hiring, firing, advancement, promotion, or any other change of status of other employees must be given pretty significant weight. So if you're gonna call somebody an exempt executive employee, they really have to be an executive in the sense of having direct impact on hiring or in that advancement, overseeing or managing people. It's very specific in order to take advantage of an exemption like this. So let's continue on, Frank, because we're gonna handle uh, our next one is what is an exempt administrative employee? So back to compensating on a salary or fee basis, a rate of not less than $455 per week. And then here comes the additional requirements. The employee's primary duty must be the performance of office or non-manual work directly related to the management or general business operations of the employer or the employer's customers. So there really has to have, there, there is an aspect of this where they're working directly as it relates to the management or general business operations. They're really pretty deeply involved in working for the company. It isn't just kind of a, uh, kind of a superficial or, you know, uh, even I would say at this juncture, you have to really look closely if you wanted to do that for a receptionist, you know, You'd have to look closely and say, gee, as far as their primary duties, okay, it's non-manual work, we know that, directly related to the management or general business operations. So you really have to say, gee, does that really conform to that? I'm not here to say one way or the other, but I'm here to tell you and you'll receive a deck, as Frank said afterwards, and you'll receive a video uh, recorded version of our presentation, but you have to think about it. It isn't just, okay, I'm just putting them on a salary and, and we're good to go. You really have to think about their responsibilities and what they're doing for the company in order to take advantage of these types of exemptions. 
let's continue on. Thank you. This is important as far as administrative uh, exemptions also. The employee's primary duty includes the exercise of discretion and independent judgment with respect to matters of importance. So think about it. They're deeply involved in the company that their duties are really important, their own judgment and their exercise of discretion with respect to matters of importance. This is significant. So somebody might be called an administrative assistant, but it doesn't mean that their duties are what I've just read over here, which is the exercise of discretion and independent judgment with respect to matters of importance. So you really have to think about who gets that administrative exemption as an employee. They really have to do some seriously important work and vital work for the company. So very, very important to think about and make sure you're doing this properly. So let's continue on. Thank you. Now, I'm just gonna spend a second on this. There was a new overtime rule and it was halted, okay? Um, it was gonna increase the uh, amount of pay from 4.55 a week to 9.13 per week, very hefty, you know, uh, over $47,000 annually. It was halted, okay? On November 22nd, a U.S. District Court of the Eastern District of Texas basically granted a permanent injunction. So nothing is happening with this right now. The only reason it's up here is that the U.S. Department of Labor has appealed this decision and things could be changing again. We will let all our folks know if in fact this is gonna be reinstated. But for anybody who might've been confused about this because it was a big deal at the end of 16, it's halted, nothing's going on right now, and it is obviously being appealed and we'll have to do a wait and see. So let's continue on, Frank, thank you. Another area that tends to create a little bit of confusion out there and for large companies and small, all over the place, uh, Microsoft years ago got hit with a huge penalty because they misclassified independent contractors and in fact were full-time employees, calling them independent contractors and not paying um, the appropriate uh, payroll taxes and so forth. And that was a huge problem for them. So it's important to really understand what does that mean? What's an independent contractor versus a full-time employee? In determining whether the person providing service is an employee or an independent contractor, all information that provides evidence of the degree of control and independence must be considered. So before we get on to what are, that, what are those degrees of control, general rule of thumb is the more you control that person, that worker, meaning their time, what they do, how they do it, working daily, for you at a certain prescribed number of, whether it's 35, 40 hours a day, that's what they're doing, it's only for your firm, that more than likely, even though you're calling them an independent contract, contractor as a full-time employee, and you have to be so careful because, as you know, if they're a full-time employee, it, everything from payroll taxes to benefits and so forth come into play, you don't wanna make a mistake on this. So we're gonna go over the various uh, degrees of control and the categories and what it all means. So let's continue on, Frank, thank you. So what are the five areas that speak to control? Okay, financial, employee benefits, availability in the marketplace, type of relationship, behavioral. And we're gonna take each one of them and just break it out for you so you'll have a really strong understanding by the time we're done with this little section. So let's continue on, thank you. So what does behavioral mean? Well, quite simply, does the company control or have the right to control what the worker does and how the worker does his or her job? An employee is generally subject to the business's instructions about when, where, and how to work. Think about it. Usually an independent contractor will be called in, uh, whether they're a consultant, you know, they're gonna bring their own expertise to the job, they're going to basically have a lot of input and so forth, but if you're the one controlling that particular worker, then we gotta be thinking about that person could, in terms of when, where, and how to work, that person quite possibly may be an employee, no matter what you're calling them. So let's continue on. Financial, very, very important. Are the business aspects of the worker's job controlled by the payer? These include things like how the worker is paid, whether expenses are reimbursed, who provides tools, supplies, and so forth. 
so basically, if the employer is really doing everything for that particular worker, weekly payment every week, all expenses picked up, um, and so forth, all the tools are supplied, pretty much everything is done on site at an employer, you're going to have to really be considering what type of classification is that person in. And employees generally guaranteed a regular wage amount for an hourly, weekly, or other period of time. This usually indicates that a worker is an employee even when the wage or salary is supplemented by a commission. Another factor, an independent contractor, a contractor is usually paid by flat fee for the job. However, it is common in some professions such as law or perhaps accounting to pay independent contractors hourly. But I think you get the gist of this. But if, if they're just primarily at your, at your place of work, they're primarily working for you, everything about their work week centers around the job that they're performing for the employer, you really have to be thinking more in terms of an employee rather than an independent contractor. But again, every situation is different. These are very, very critical guidelines to really consider when you're trying to figure out which classification. So let's continue, Frank, thank you. Employee benefits. Are you giving benefits? Things like insurance, pension plans, paid vacations, sick days, disability insurance, and so forth. Businesses generally do not grant these benefits to independent contractors. However, the lack of these types of benefits does not necessarily mean the worker is an independent contractor. So what that means is, if you're, <laughs> if whether you do or you don't, because sometimes you don't give your own full-time employees benefits or very minimal benefits, it isn't necessarily the full deciding factor. It just gets rolled into, hmm, if I've got all the other stuff, financial, I'm controlling their time and controlling everything about them, and I'm giving them employee benefits, it's another factor. So it really, what happens is you kind of have to roll it all in with all the different categories and then come out with a, an answer about which class it is. So let's continue on. Thank you. Type of relationship. If you hire a worker with the expectation that the relationship will continue indefinitely rather than for a specific project or pay period, this is generally considered evidence that the intent was to create an employer-employee relationship. Now, again, um, you may have an accountant or you know an attorney that works a certain number of hours and so forth, and we all understand that that is a that's a consultative that that is definitely an independent more an independent contractor scenario, but if that person is just working week in and week out, month in and month out, and is really not looking for anything else, they're not doing anything else except working for you, then you really have to consider the employer-employee relationship. Another very important factor is availability in the marketplace. An independent contractor is generally free to seek out business opportunities. Independent contractor, contractors often advertise, maintain a visible business location, and are available to work in the relevant market. So in other words, if you've got somebody who never really promotes themselves for any other reason uh, for, or, or just has really doesn't hang a shingle out, so to speak, they just really are just working for you, and that's all they're doing and not for anyone else at all, no other clients, well, again, you got to look at that classification because no matter what they're calling themselves, it could quite possibly be an employer-employee relationship. So let's continue on. Thank you. We're going to now handle something all of us have encountered, and it's very more important than one might think, and that's new employee orientations. So you want to review what you currently have. Some people call it onboarding or new employee orientation. But what do you do for welcoming new employees and familiarizing themselves, them with the company's basic management practices. And I know for many folks out there who have smaller businesses, you know, you're probably thinking to yourself, oh gosh, do I have time? What do you mean onboarding? I just, you know, hire them, show them around a little bit and everybody, let's get working. But it really makes a big difference. And I'll tell you why. That first impression over the first week or two weeks or three weeks can have a, a huge impact on that new employee for the rest of their term with you. Meaning if they've got a great positive impression, and they feel welcome, they see everything's done professionally, the likelihood is they're going to stay. They're going to stay longer. They're going to stay with you. And as we all know, the replacement of somebody who leaves, you know, let's say they leave after a month or two months and then have to, again, advertise for a new, um, you know, recruiting for a new employee and then training them again, 
there's a lot of money involved if you keep if there's a kind of revolving door going on. So having a good new employee orientation program is a great step in making sure you retain employees. So what do you do? You assign here's here, these are just tips that we think have been very effective for folks out there. Assign one of your employees to show your new hire the new workplace environment, make introductions, and respond to any questions. This is a great way to put your new employee at ease. You also want to encourage the employee to welcome and support the new employee. So it's all about kind of the warm and fuzzies, the positive feeling, the professionalism that, you know, that first impression, all of that matters. That's all part of your program. So let's continue on, Frank. Thank you. These are more tips. Create a, and this is small, but so it's so important though, create a great first impression by making the employee's work location clean and organized. Think about it. It's like moving into a new, uh, moving into a new home and everything's clean and in order and exactly what it, where it should be. That makes a difference to that new person. Be sure that access to the company's network or internet or email and phone extension is set up for your new employee. What you ideally want is all of that done by the time they start their first day versus, oh, it's your first day. Oh, the next two or three or four days, we'll try to get you all set up. It makes a difference to that new employee. It shows organization. Everything's well thought out. It's organized. All good stuff. And if necessary, arrange for a building pass, IDs, a parking pass, even something as small as a parking pass. That happens, you know, we have a fair number of employees over here. And bottom line is, is, we're always careful, even something like the parking pass, you want to make sure as that they have that. There's no worry for them to go out and have to spend money on a meter or anything like that. It just means that it's done professionally. It's all thought out for them. So let's continue on. Thank you, Frank. Just a few more tips here. If you will be providing an employee handbook, make sure it is ready to be distributed along with a benefits information packet. Everybody wants to know what's going on as far as policies, their benefits program, very, very important. There have been studies done that uh, a good benefits program, frankly speaking, is one of the biggest retention tools out there. So you want to make sure your new employee knows all there is to know about benefits, what's happening, benefits communications, that's all part of this, so that they feel comfortable and well taken care of. Now, this is very important. And last but not least in this little grouping over here, safety training. You want to make sure, you know, whether it's, you know, basic employer safety training. And although it may seem if, you know, you have a consulting firm or it's not manufacturing, and it's, uh, especially, by the way, if it's manufacturing in areas where there could be some dangerous equipment or, or, or the like, absolutely, that safety training has to kick in immediately because the employer is obligated to provide a safe, safe work environment. But even if you have, let's say, like I said, a consulting firm, an accounting firm, or anything that, you know, um, is more in kind of the white collar range of, of, of services, service firm, you still have to make sure people know where the exits are and know your basic safety related to that as well. Um, again, um, fire extinguishers and so forth. Don't take anything for granted because you're smaller and say, well, gee, we're so small. Why does it matter? It does. If you have employees of any number, safety is a very, very high priority. So let's continue on. Thanks, Frank. Now we're going to talk about what is an employee handbook, some basics, okay? Employee handbooks should be used to effectively communicate information regarding your company's policies, practices, and employee benefits. The employee handbook is the single most important internal document that lays out the policies of your company. So you need to each and every one of your employees. There's also a consistency aspect to this. And by the way, for those of folks of you who have the HR library, there is an employee handbook generator in there, plus templates, guidance, all the good things. But I'm going to give you some right now for those folks um, who are just with us today, just to get the basics in. Be sure to consider federal, state, and local laws and regulations that may affect your business when drafting your employee handbook. It's important to have employment counsel review the handbook before you publish and distribute it. And the reason we say this, and it is a little bit of money to have a professional look at it, but you might be in a special industry. There may be certain state laws, and your HR library does cover the state laws. But, you know, if you're doing it yourself, have professional guidance. Take a look at it. Make sure you've done everything you're supposed to do because just a little bit of extra advanced planning 
making sure everything is in order is really, really valuable and well worth doing. So let's continue on. Thank you. So I'm going to just cover some of the basic areas right now with you related to the sections of the handbook for general employment information, work schedules, computers and technology, anti-discrimination policies, standards of conduct, employee benefits, compensation, safety and security, leave policy. So we're going to quickly tick through these and then let's continue on. Thanks, Frank. General employment information. Your employee handbook should include an overview of business, general employment policies related to employment eligibility, job classifications, employee records, job postings, termination and resignation procedures, and un union information if, if applicable. Just gives you the big picture of what goes into that particular area. Let's continue on. Thanks, Frank. Very, very important, anti-discrimination policies. As an employer, you must comply with the Equal Employment Opportunity Laws prohibiting discrimination and harassment, including the Americans with Disabilities Act. Your employee handbook should include a section about these laws and how your employees are expected to comply. It's just very important. Now, something that you really have to keep in mind, again, are the state laws. Sometimes there are very specific state laws related to discrimination in some of these other areas and they have to be checked out. Again, your HR library will have a lot of this information, but it's important to know, to know what's going on on the federal side of the fence and on the state side of the fence. This section is also a good place to set out your sexual harassment prevention policy and a statement of, of your compliance with all employment discrimination and related legal requirements. So really, it sets a tone that these are the standards of behavior and practice that happens when you work for a company like yours. So that, and let me tell you something, the more clearly this is communicated, the, the, the less likely there will be an uh, issue related, let's say, to sexual harassment because you've got your policy, and I might add, training is also very important too. It's not the handbook, but you really wanna take these preemptive steps to make sure you're doing the right thing to prevent something like sexual harassment in, the, in your workplace. So very, very important. And there is actually um, a, a sexual harassment prevention training module uh, in your HR library if you have it. But the whole concept here is preventative, laying out the policies, training if necessary. All of these things are so important when it comes to these kinds of areas. And remember folks, we're in a much more litigious society. People aren't just gonna sit there and take it. If there is an issue related to sexual harassment, you wanna prevent it from ever, ever happening. Let's continue on. Thanks, Frank. Compensation. Again, still on the employee handbook, clearly explain to your employees that your company will make necessary deductions for federal and state taxes, voluntary deductions for the company's benefits programs, and so forth. In addition, you may outline your company's legal obligations regarding overtime pay, pay schedules, and bonus compensation. I think the key here is that whether you have an employee handbook or you just communicate the policies separately, you want to make sure they're clear. So there's absolutely no misunderstanding in any of these areas because you have it clearly stated in writing so there can be no disputes. Let's continue on, thank you. Another important one for the handbook, or again, a separate policy if you're not doing the handbook, describe your company's policies regarding work hours and schedules, attendance, punctuality, and reporting absences, along with guidelines for flexible schedules and, telecommut and telecommuting if offered. Again, clear and straightforward. Let's continue on. Standards of contact, I'm sorry, conduct. Make sure you set expectations for how you want employees to conduct themselves in your workplace from dress code to ethics. In addition, it's important to remind your employees of any legal obligations they may, to, they may need to comply with on the job. For example, your company's legal obligation to protect customer data. So all the areas that you're you're, you as an employer are committed to, those should be communicated, like this one about protecting customer data or any other one that is involved in your particular line of business. The key is, though, to make sure it's in writing so that everybody is crystal clear about what those standards are. Let's continue on. Thank you, Frank. Safety and security. Describe your company's policy for creating a safe and secure workplace, including compliance with OSHA, as many of you know it, the acronym Occupational Safety and Health Administration's laws that require employees to report all accidents, injuries, potential safety hazards, safety suggestions, and health and safety related issues to management. 
this is so, I can't emphasize this enough. I know I mentioned it before, but safety is a top requirement and priority for any employer. And under that are areas like report of accidents, injuries, making sure um, to deal with potential safety hazard, hazards and so forth, and reporting all of those when needed and necessary to management. Again, super, super important. Another aspect of safety is there should be a safe, there, many people do have it, safety policies should also include your company's policy regard, regarding bad weather and hazardous community conditions. You know, in the middle of the, let's put it this way, we're in the Northeast, there's lots of snow in the winter, there has to be a protocol in place. In other words, if everybody's snowed in, who's in charge? Communicating to everybody what has to happen depending on where they live and safety, safety first, always. But there has to be a protocol in place. So that's all part of this. Let's continue on, thanks. Finally, add your commitment to creating a, a secure work environment and your employees' responsibilities for abiding by all physical and information security policies such as locking file cabinets or computers when, they, computers when they aren't in use. And you also want to outline your policies on appropriate computer, software, email, and social media use. And I'm just going to take one moment on cybersecurity in general. I know many of you may have seen in the papers, you know, various types of large companies, medium-sized companies have been hacked for any reason, ransomware and so forth. And a lot of that prevention starts with important security policies in place so that your employees know, know what to do is related to email, phishing emails, and so forth. But what you don't want is you don't want to put this particular policy in place after an employer has experienced um, a, 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 a cybersecurity breach. You want, it, you want it to do it so that you have done everything you know how to protect computers, servers, and so forth and then instructions to employees. It doesn't sound like it's all that important, especially if it's a smaller company, but it is. It's very important. And it's something that even if you spend a second thinking about it right now and thought, you know, really, I, I really need to look at the security of my computers, get an email policy in place related to, let's say, phishing or other areas related to cybersecurity, that could be probably the single most important thing you do today if you just get into that. So let's continue on, thank you. So as far as employee benefits, you want to include benefits of your particular program, whatever they may be, um, whether it's um, their eligibility and all the, all the benefits that are required by law, such as disability insurance, workers' compensation, COBRA, any areas that you need to comply with should be in there. And if you don't want to have them in your handbook, there should be just a benefit summary overview to make sure that you communicate what clearly you have in your program and what is being offered. Um, the employee benefit section should also outline plans for health insurance, retirement, employee assistance, tuition, any of the other benefits. The most important thing here is it doesn't have to be in the handbook, but there should be a clear and concise benefit summary. What you want to avoid, folks, is that somebody didn't really understand the benefits they were entitled to and ended up paying out of pocket for stuff that, in fact, was covered. You don't want to go to any of those places. You want to make sure there's a clear and concise benefit summary of all benefits. Very, very important. Let's continue on. Thanks, Frank. Leave policies. Your company's leave policies should be carefully documented, especially those you are required to provide by law. Family Medical Leave Act, depending on the size and state requirements. Jury duty, military leave, time off for jury, jury duty and voting should all be documented to, to comply with federal, state, and local laws. In addition, you should explain your policies for vacation, holiday, bereavement, and sick leave. This is the way of the world, folks. Benefits are super important. And although I know there's a lot to comply with, because again, there are varied nuances here related to state law, state law requirements in some of these leaves, especially, like I said, um, family leave for some of the big states out there. But we have to get it all straightened out and clearly communicated so your employees have their expectations clearly set and they know exactly what they're entitled to. Clears up a lot of issues. So let's continue on, Frank, thank you. We're gonna go on to performance reviews. So everybody out there, if you've got even a couple of employees and maybe you put this off a little bit because you know, no time, you know, you quickly talk about something and then you, know, you give a raise or you don't, 
but there is a methodology. There is a way to do this properly, and we're going to review it quickly here. And again, for those who have the HR library, there are interactive tools like the Performance Review Builder. Very, very important. And oh my gosh, so easy to use. We all use it over here. Um, we've even had universities actually study it, you know, in terms of, hey, this is a great way to do this and, and have actually take, taken it up in class here and there. But there are some very, very specific guidelines that we're going to go, even if you don't have access to the uh, interactive tool that you should follow. First and foremost, you want to review and update employee job descriptions at least annually. You also want to keep accurate documentation regarding the performance for each employee. This documentation should be direct, factual, and detail-oriented to support disciplinary or other personal decisions. Base employee performance reviews on specific job-related criteria. In other words, you don't want to, if at all possible, you really want to avoid anything that sounds like a personal attack in any way, shape, or form. It should be based. That's why we ask you to update the and keep it maintained, the employee job description, so that it, it syncs up with the performance review because, hey, here are the job responsibilities and how is that particular employee doing as far as that's concerned. So, and you also, again, want to avoid any emotional aspect to this. You want it factual, detail-oriented, and in there should always be a paper trail to support disciplinary or other personnel decisions. It shouldn't just be kind of one verbal uh, performance review, and the performance review should be in writing, by the way, not just a verbal, so that if anything crops up, then you know that you've got your paper trail, you've got your performance review intact there, or any other areas related to discipline or anything else, it's all set up and done. You want to have this organized and um, basically in sync with how the person's doing. What do I mean by that? The feedback should be honest, factual and complete. And, and here's an example. Let's say somebody just didn't want to deal with a confrontation and basically gave somebody a pretty good performance review, okay? But in the end, they got fired three or four months later because they, you know, that particular employer didn't want to confront all the issues. That employee could have a potential case against that employer because they could say, hey, listen, I got a great performance review. I knew nothing of anything that I was doing wrong. I feel this was an unfair termination and away we go. So you really have to have it factual, honest, and complete. And if there's an issue, it should be brought up in a professional manner and not go to some place where it doesn't match to what the actual employee's performance actually was versus um, what's in that performance review. They've got to sync up. Let's continue on, thank you compare performance against job descriptions as mentioned and goals to offer ongoing feedback. And by the way, that's really important. The ongoing feedback is so critical because you don't, if, if possible, you don't just want to do this once a year as an entire performance review, but if you can help that uh, employee to overcome an obstacle, achieve more during the course of the year, that's your ideal. Okay, not just waiting once a year to kind of let it all hang out at that performance review, but continuously working to help that employee do better, set, in, set more goals, set, set short-term goals, all of those make a big difference in the ultimate performance of that employee. Keep the review process and, system, and systems for measuring performance fair to all employees. In other words, if you are using a tool like our uh, uh, interactive performance review builder, that's great because it's the same one for everybody. You want to use be consistent versus looking at certain employees being reviewed in one manner and other employees being reviewed in an offhand manner. Everybody should be reviewed with the same techniques, technology, so it's fair to all. Let's continue on, Frank. Thank you. Termination discipline, very, very important. Review, it's probably the single most sensitive and potentially the litigious area of the entire employee relationship. Let's face it. This is where it is right now. So the watchword is, please be careful and must comply with so many best practices. Again, you have to really think very, very carefully about this whole entire area. Review all discipline, investigation, and termination procedures for compliance 
with applicable federal and state laws and enforce them fairly and consistently. Okay, that means that you can't be disciplining somebody for one thing and the other, let's say you have to like somebody else a little bit more and you decide to just bypass that with that with a second person. It's got to be fair. Investigating any issues has to be fair and methodical. And then same thing with termination procedures. They should be the same consistently across the board and to be sure to check federal and state laws related to anything that might be um, an issue. So it is anything in this area should be carefully thought out, planned, and documented in writing so that, especially, you know, as an example of disciplining, there's a process where you do a verbal, again, this is covered in your HR library, do a verbal, and then there's a first written warning notice and a second written warning notice. You do it in a methodical manner so that everything is documented. It's done clearly. It's never done in anger. It's just done in a professional manner. That's what makes the difference. That's what protects the employer and the employee. Be sure policies and procedures for handling employee disciplinary actions and investigations are clearly defined, written, and communicated to employees as appropriate, meaning that it isn't just kind of an emotional reaction. There are procedures in place, like the ones I just mentioned, so that employees know what to expect. You're setting expectations, and they understand that these are the policies of the company. Remember I talked about paper trail. Carefully document all matters involving employee discipline, including warnings, as talked about, investigations, and terminations, without concise summaries and documentation. That leaves much more exposure to the employer. So although it may take extra time and effort, doing it professionally and doing it methodically is ultimately the best possible protection for all, particularly the employer and the employee. Let's continue on. Termination meetings, how do you do them? Termination meetings are advised and should be conducted to achieve the following. You want to inform the employee of the termination. You want to discuss the return of company property and deliver the final paycheck and facilitate the employee's departure. So provide departing employees with a written summary of accrued benefits and notices regarding post-termination benefits, including where applicable, compensation for vacation and sick time, continuation of health coverage, severance pay, 401k plan information, and this is incredibly important, be sure to comply with any applicable federal or state requirements because they will vary from the final paycheck through accrual of vacation time. This is very, very important that this is well-researched. For the folks who have the library, you'll have it there, but you must research this before you do that termination meeting so that everything is planned for. And frankly speaking, you're in compliance with federal and state laws. The last thing you want to do is conduct this meeting and be breaching any type of federal or state requirement. And you want to be careful about the return of company property. So let's continue on. Thanks, Frank. This is important about company property and you know closing off everything. Make sure policies are in place for collecting keys and other company property from the terminated employee and confirm that access to computer systems, email, and voicemail is deactivated. Again, remember we were talking about cybersecurity? The last thing you want in the world is for a terminated employee to still have access to your servers, to your computer systems, to email, to anything along those lines. And sometimes in the haste, or if there's not a proper procedure followed, things could slip through the cracks. Very, very critically important that all of this is taken care of uh, by, the day, by the actual day of termination and deliver final paychecks at the time of termination or as otherwise required by state law. As I mentioned, a lot of states have different laws related to final paycheck and when they should be given, they must be complied with. Let's continue on, thank you. Deliver, this is, this is so important also. You know, we're talking about references now. Deliver neutral references confirming a former employee's position held and dates of employment upon request and in accordance with company policy. Why do I say do, it, do a neutral one? Because if you said something negative about a particular departed employee and that resulted in them not getting a position, there could be complications after. What is the safest, best way to do this? Just neutral, just confirming the employee's position and the dates of employment. That's the safest, 
best way to handle that. Keep a summary of the termination meeting and any related information in the employee's personnel file. Let's go on, Frank, thank you. Well, that is our final slide. And I have to tell you, I, I have done this any number of times before. I always enjoy giving this over to you because I know if you can at least adapt to three, four, or five of these significant issues, think about them some more, implement them, that's gonna do so much for your company. Before we go though, I have a couple of questions. Um, I've seen that some folks have uh, asked us and I'd be happy to just share them with you. Question one is, how soon do I need to provide a new employee with a summary plan description? Remember the SPD for employees uh, who are participants in an ERISA covered health plan or group plan? A new employee must be provided a summary plan description. I would say within, the law is within 90 days after the employee becomes a plan participant. So there is a deadline there. It's within 90 days after the employee becomes a plan participant. And second question is, uh, I have my new employees fill out I-9 forms. I downloaded and printed a couple years ago. Have these forms been updated? Oh, this is an excellent question. Yes, form I-9 is, is updated fairly frequently. In general, employers are required to use the latest, that's the latest, most current form I-9, so employers should pay attention as to when the form is updated by the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. So that's all we have today, folks. And we'll look forward to having you join us again for new upcoming webinars. Thanks a lot.